ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've been enjoying the conference so far, and we're going to continue our plenary session this morning with a talk from Hugh Della. Hugh is a writer, teacher, and teacher trainer at the University of Westminster, and is here on behalf of Heinle Sengage, who's, uh, who have their promotional stands in the foyer. Hugh will be speaking today on putting our words to work, rethinking, teaching, talking time. Please show your appreciation for Hugh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it always makes me slightly nervous when people clap before I've said anything. I always feel like the expectation levels must be very high. Um, as you heard, my name is Hugh Della, and most of the time uh, I teach general English and I'm a trainer at the University of Westminster. And I'm also a, a course book writer. Uh, I've written two series called Innovations and Outcomes, which are published by Heinle Cengage. Um, I hope it's okay with you if I talk from the front here. Um, I'm hoping that I'm tall enough to be able to get away with doing this. I'm also worried if I talk on the stage, at some point I'm going to fall off the gap between these two things as I'm wandering around between audiences. Um, following on from Lindsay's plenary this morning, I feel like I should begin quickly with a, a, a vague tech warning. Um, I'm not actually going to be mentioning technology at all during this talk. Um, <laughs> wasn't necessarily something you have to applaud. But, um, <laughs> uh, if this is a problem for anybody, you're probably in the wrong plenary. Uh, I will, however, be talking about teaching, and particularly about an area of teaching that I think has had a very problematic press, and an area of teaching that I think has caused teachers a lot of stress over the years, which is the whole area of teacher talking time. One of the strange things, I think, about English language teaching is we're a profession which really loves an acronym. Um, for a start, you've got ELT. Then you've got endless arguments about what is it exactly we're supposed to be teaching. Are we teaching EFL, English as a foreign language? Or are we teaching ESL, English as a second language? Or EIL, English as an international language? Or ELF, English as a lingua franca? Uh, once you get past these debates, uh, you have to learn about things like OHE, Observe, Hypothesize, Experiment. I'm sure all of you have read about PPP, Present, Practice, Pray Like Hell, that one day maybe the students will be able to the language. But within all the many acronyms in our profession, none of them has quite the appalling press that the dreaded TTT has. And particularly, I think, since the CLT, Communicative Language Teaching Revolution, TTT has become a kind of taboo concept or, or a kind of negative concept within English language teaching. When I did my own CELTA back in 1993... Well, okay, the slides have gone mixed up somehow. Um, when I did my own CELTA back in 1993, and it's always slightly embarrassing talking about my entry point into English language teaching in front of non-native speaker teachers because I know for the non-natives in the room, which is the vast majority of you, your training and your qualifications for entering language teaching will have been far superior to mine. Uh, like many native speakers, I drifted into language teaching on the back of a one-month, four-week, 20-day CELTA course, I'm almost ashamed to admit, and when I was thinking about putting this talk together, I went back to check what I was told about teacher talking time in these early formative days as I entered the profession. And as I went through my lesson plans and I went through my notes from my CELTA course, I found I was basically told three things about teacher talking time. And maybe they ring bells with some of you. Maybe they're similar to the kinds of pieces of advice you were given. The first thing I was told was, Keep TTT to a minimum. Yes, boss. Don't tell the students what they can tell you. And the less time you spend talking, the more time students will have to talk. And basically, I went out into the world of teaching with these three pieces of advice ringing in my ears. And once I started teaching, and I became curious about the profession, and I started reading more, I found these kinds of negative attitudes towards TTT were very much reflected in the literature. 
One of the first things I read was a book by Jim Scrivener, which many of you may know, called Learning Teaching. And again, when I was putting this talk together, I went back and started exploring what Jim had to say about TTT. And there wasn't much. And basically what there was, was negative, again. Uh, he tells us that we should ask questions instead of giving explanations. So, you know, when the students ask us, what does it mean? What do you think it means? Well, I'm not sure, that's why I'm asking you. But why is it you're asking me instead of asking yourself? I was told to use gestures to replace unnecessary teacher talking time. And if any of you have ever seen those International House videos from the 80s where teachers gesticulated wildly like this, you know, whilst doing the silent way. Uh, I guess it was this kind of idea. And again, we're told, make sure you always increase opportunity for student talking time. <coughs> and the basic idea that I had uh, about teacher talking time when I first entered the profession was that somehow teacher talking time and student teacher talking time existed in this oppositional seesaw kind of relationship. And that the more one increased, the more the other automatically decreased. You know, less teacher talking time equals more student talking time, and vice versa. And the idea that there might be any more complex relationship between what we say as teachers and what our students say as learners seems to me to be glossed over, or not really to exist within the literature. So, once I started teaching, my own early years very much followed the kind of advice that I've been given. And my poor students, initially in London, and later working in monolingual contexts in Indonesia, where I spent a few years... Is that the air conditioning? Okay. Uh, uh, the, my, my early teaching was very much based around these kinds of concepts. Uh, I subjected my students to endless miming, endless elicitation, a lot of closed yes-no questions that I was asking because I thought they were helping me to check concepts. So I'd ask lots of yes-no questions about texts, questions that help me get the answers from the students. And if you think about classroom interaction as a kind of eternal love triangle, if you like, between the teachers, the students, and the material, okay? And the different ways that you can put that kind of triangle together. For me, when I first started teaching, the material was very, very much the dominant partner in this relationship. All of the talking that I did in the classroom was basically because of the activities in the books. A lot of the talking was just to proceduralise the activities, to tell students what we were doing next, to tell them what not to do. And most of the student talking time was basically to practice language, particularly to practice grammar. And the materials were very much the filter through which all of the teacher-student communication occurred. And I think for the first four or five years of my teaching career, I was very reliant on the course book for change of pace, reliant on the course book to bring interesting items, interesting people into the classroom, and reliant on the course book to encourage the students to talk. And I was, I thought, a student-centered teacher that holy grail of communicative language teaching. And I think, if you follow this kind of construct of no teacher talking time, good, lots of student talking time, excellent, if you follow this to its logical end point, you get a kind of madness. And I'm going to give you three examples of the kinds of madnesses that I think can occur from following these ideas about TTT. To my shame, the first kind of madness I'm going to tell you about was something that happened in one of my own classes. When I first started teaching, I was working at a private language school in London called St Giles. And I had an upper intermediate class, and it was a Friday afternoon, and we were doing a fluency-based class. And at the time, I didn't really know what I was supposed to be doing in these classes, apart from maximising opportunities for student talking time. So I'd set up these discussions or these debates and the students would chat away for an hour in kind of broken upper intermediate level English and I would go away at the end of the hour thinking, God, oh, they were all talking kind of English, I must be a great student centred teacher. <laughs> and one day with this upper intermediate group, we were doing a debate about the pros and cons of city life versus living in the country, as you do. And I had one Czech student in the class 
who refused to grab this golden opportunity to maximise her student talking time. And she sat there all the way through the lesson with a kind of sour face on her, not saying anything. And for some reason that I wasn't really conscious of at the time, this annoyed me. And at the end of the lesson, I stopped the group and said, OK, that was great. You were all kind of talking English. Brilliant. Except you, I noticed. Maybe you'd like to say something now. No. Come on, this is your great opportunity to maximise your student talking time. At which point she burst into tears and ran out of the room. And I left this experience kind of realising that not all students always want to maximise their opportunities for student talking time in the way that I've been told. Another time when I started thinking about this was when I first became a CELTA trainer. And I was running one of my early CELTA courses at Westminster. And we had a young trainee on the course who'd read all the literature before he came onto the course. He'd read Harmer and he'd read Scrivener and he was ready to go. And in one of his early teaching practices, uh, he had a 20 minute teaching practice slot and he was supposed to do a reading. And he began the lesson by saying, OK, in a minute we're going to do a reading, but first I have a question for you. What's the difference between working in a mine and working in a hotel? Anybody? And he started doing the kind of mad elicitation arm waving thing. And the students sort of looked at each other and went, mine and hotel, very different. Okay, for example, what kind of differences? Well, a mine is underground. Okay, anything else? A hotel could be chambermaid, could be receptionist. Okay, anything else? And this went on for about 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, I broke the golden rule of Tefl observation and sort of interrupted and uh, started like a demented football manager kind of waving at my watch from the back of the room. And uh, he looked quite annoyed by this and said, OK, I give up. I'll tell you. The word I was looking for was the service industry. We're going to read about the service industry. <laughs> and afterwards, I was thinking about how to try and frame the feedback, how to try and you know, encourage reflection upon the nature of the lesson that had occurred to see if uh, there was some discussion we could have about this. And I asked, you know, how did you feel about the lead-in? Yeah, I thought it was good. Right, any feelings about the time it took? Well, they didn't get it, but it said in the Scrivener book, never tell the students what you can get them to tell you, okay? So again, I went away from this thinking, right, that there's something kind of strange about the way these ideas about TTT and STT are being interpreted. And the final story was something that actually happened to a friend of mine who's a Czech high school teacher who did a teacher training course in a well-known training centre in the UK. And on the first day of the course, he turned up to the classroom with a group of other teachers from around the world. And nine o'clock came, the trainer wasn't there. Five past nine, no trainer. Ten past nine, everyone's starting to get a bit nervous, wondering if they're in the wrong room. Quarter past nine, a disembodied voice ushered forth into the room, saying, if you are looking for me, you are looking in the wrong place. Who said that? <laughs> I am merely the facilitator of your own development. You are at the centre of your own learning. I can only show you where the water is. You have to drink for yourself. And um, sadly, instead of sparking a sort of mass student-centred self-facilitation of learning, what actually happened was the game descended into a kind of hide-and-seek competition. And so the trainer was found hiding in the cupboard. And when I look back on my own teaching experience, I realise that, to my regret, I think, when I first started teaching, I very rarely asked students questions I didn't know the answer to. Uh, I spent three years living in Indonesia, and one of the things I really feel bad about now is that I knew whether they could use the present perfect, I knew whether they could pronounce three or tree correctly, but I very rarely found out much about my students' loves, their lives, their hates, their experiences, their beliefs. But luckily for me, nevertheless, the students seemed to respond to my youthful enthusiasm, and uh, I managed to keep my job, which was a good thing. And sometimes, I'm sure none of you have done this, and I'm ashamed to confess to it, but sometimes after a particularly late night, I would find that I hadn't prepared my classes quite as thoroughly as perhaps I should have done. And as a result, in the classrooms when I was teaching, I'd find myself lapsing into the kind of dreaded TTT that I'd been warned about. I would tell my students about myself, my life in London, my family, my exes. And amazingly, 
students seemed even happier than when we were going through exercises about the present perfect. And I started to realise that maybe teacher talking time could be a force for the good. But at this point, I had no idea how to harness this kind of force. Where are we? One minute. But I'm not saying, I think, to begin with, uh, and I should make this clear, I'm not saying that teacher talking in and of itself is necessarily a good thing. And I would be the first person to acknowledge that teacher talking time still prevails in a lot of classrooms. I think still far too many teachers either engage in this kind of backpacker-like chit-chat of the kind that I used to do with my students in Indonesia, or else they do these kind of lengthy school mom style lectures about the beauty of the English language, the complexity of the grammar system, the etymology of the lexicon, while the students nod off and send text messages from the back of the class. And obviously, teacher talking time is still alive and well. And I think a lot of the time, either boring students to death or entertaining them without remotely educating them. And as I said, I'm not saying that teacher talking time in itself is a good thing. And I think it's worth briefly just looking a little bit at bad teacher talking time. I'm not saying that chatting in and of itself is a desirable activity. I'm also not advocating a return to these kinds of classrooms of the past where the teacher pours forth in this one-way conversational traffic while the students sort of take notes if you're lucky or sleep if you're not. And again, just a couple of examples of where I think we shouldn't be going. The first one, sadly, was also something I was guilty of. When I first started teaching, probably like most native speaker teachers, I had a real terror of grammar. Um, I didn't learn much about grammar at school, even doing an English literature degree, I didn't really learn much. And when I first started teaching, I had a lot of Italian students who used to ask me terrifying grammar questions. You know, Q, is it the subjunctive? <laughs> Maybe. And uh, one day I had this uh, intermediate level class, and I had a guy called Luigi in there, an Italian guy, who was a real kind of grammar hound. And uh, I used to have to go home every day before class and read all the grammar notes at the back of the course book and memorise them, so that when Luigi asked me questions, I was on top of the questions and could pretend that I knew what I was talking about by repeating them, parapassion. And he'd been asking me questions about the present simple, and um, I used to think that the present simple was quite simple. It's in the present, it's quite simple. What is there to say about it? But he was really worried about it, so I went home, and uh, I had uh, the, the meatiest grammar book I could find, which was Leach's A to Z of English Grammar. And I read through it, and it said, there are 15 uses of the present simple. <laughs> oh my god, okay. I better read them all. And I read them all about 15 times, and after the 15th time, this light bulb kind of came on in my head, and I thought, I've got it. So the next morning, I got to class really early, and I had one of those old-fashioned whiteboards. Um, I wrote up 15 sentences on the board, and as the students came into the class, they looked nervously at the board and could sense something was slightly wrong. And they said, don't worry, I'm just going to do a little bit of grammar, nothing to panic about. And as they sort of filed in and sat down, I started saying, okay, you've been asking me about the present symbol, going to tell you everything you need to know about it. And I started going through the sentences and explaining them all, all the different uses. And by the time I got to number five, the eyes were glazing slightly. <laughs> by the time I got to number seven, the heads were kind of starting to nod. And mercifully, by the time I got to number eight, Luigi put his hand up. I had this kind of fear of, oh, he's going to ask something. <laughs> yeah, Hugh, this is really interesting, but what do you want me to do with this information? <laughs> and as soon as he asked this question, I realised that any answer I could give was stupid because my answer was something like, I want you to listen, note it down, understand it, never make any mistakes again with the present symbol and stop asking me about it. Well, let's just rub the board off and go on with the lesson. Uh, another example of, I think, kind of mad and bad TTT uh, came about from a, a book launch I did. Years ago, I had my first elementary level course book, uh, Elementary Innovations, come out. And I did this talk, and at the end, uh, a kind of slightly wild-eyed looking man came up to me and shook me very firmly by the hand. That was great. I'd do exactly what you do. 
which always makes me slightly nervous when people tell me this. So, okay, good, that's, that's nice to know. I'm glad we think in the same way. Yeah, what would you do in this situation, right? I'm teaching an elementary class at the moment, and we're using Blueprint Advanced, Blueprint Elementary. Do you know it? And I knew of it, but I didn't know the book. So, no, why? So, well, the other day, I was doing a text about dolphins, okay? And it included the vocabulary, search and destroy mechanism. What would you do in this situation? And I was thinking, well, probably I would try and avoid texts about dolphins which include the word search and destroy mechanism <laughs> with elementary students. But don't tell me what you did. And he said, oh, no, no, I use this as an opportunity. So I taught them search and destroy mechanisms. Then I taught them search and destroy missions. Then I taught them heat-seeking missiles, scud weapons, commando attacks. And uh, he said that like he sort of went off on a kind of military fantasist list of random vocabulary for killing people in wars, while the students presumably sort of were still looking up what search and destroy meant in their dictionaries. So, too much teacher talking time without student involvement and without student guidance. Now, it's clearly a bad thing, I think. But, I think the reason that the whole idea of teacher talking time is important is because as teachers, we spend a percentage. Personally, I think it should be quite a large of our time talking. And I think TTT has profound implications for the classroom dynamics and for the kind of learning experience we provide for our students. And now, after 18 years of teaching, I've come to believe not only that TTT should not be avoided, but that actually teacher talking time is at the heart of good teaching. And I've now come to believe that how much we say, and maybe more crucially, what we actually say, is very, very important. And I've also come to disbelieve this idea of the seesaw. I've come to think, actually, that if we really want to improve the quality and the quantity of student talking time, then teacher talking time has a central role to play. And what I want to move on to do for the rest of this talk is to really just consider and categorise, if you like, some good kinds of teacher talking time. One of the first times that I started thinking about this was at the first IATEFL conference I ever went to. Uh, I think it was 1998 or 1999 in Brighton. And at this time I was, you know, I was just a young teacher, I was quite intimidated seeing all these famous names up on the stage. And I saw Scott Thornbury do a talk about grammar. And in this talk, he was talking about kind of how not to teach grammar and the reason why grammar obsession is bad. And he put forward this story, I'm hoping it's a kind of urban legend or an apocryphal story, about uh, the mad, bad and dangerous to be taught by grammar-obsessed teacher. And on the handouts that I think you should have somewhere between you, you can see the example of the conversation Scott mentioned. Uh, if you don't all have a handout, don't panic. Uh, I'll tell you later how you can all get one, okay? If you just look on the front page, there's this example of bad teacher talking time. Can you see it? Yeah? Um, I don't have it with me, but basically it goes something like, sorry I know come class, my mum, she breaked the leg. The grammar obsessed teacher only processes the grammar mistake and says, you know, breaked, breaked. Yes, my mum, she broke the leg. No, it's broke, it's irregular. I, sorry teacher, my mum, she broke the leg. Good, good, okay. Now let's do some more work on irregular past simple forms. Turn to page 41. And when I first heard this, obviously I thought, this is not the kind of teacher I'd like to be. And uh, this is not a good way for us to treat our students. The problem that I had when I was watching it was what the alternatives were. And at the time, my feeling was that what was being advocated is that instead of being primarily focused on form and primarily focused on mistakes, we should instead be primarily communicative, touchy-feely, sensitive, responsive to our students as real people. Which is fine, up to a point, I think. But if you then imagine the conversation that the caring, sharing teacher has with the student whose mother she breaks the leg, it doesn't actually go much further in terms of what happens in the classroom. So the second example you've got here is what I think the kind of you know, humanistic language teacher might do in this situation. The poor student comes to class. Sorry I know come class. My mum, she broke the leg. Oh no, that's awful. I'm so sorry. How terrible. 
terrible. Anyway, open your books at page 43 and we'll do some more work on irregular past simple verbs, because you clearly need it. And what I started to think about was the fact that just being nice doesn't get us much further in the classroom. Uh, it certainly makes us less hated, which is a good thing, but I don't think it necessarily makes us better teachers. And I've been a victim of this myself. When I was living in Jakarta, in Indonesia, after about two and a half years living there, I felt like my Indonesian had gone as far as it could on the street. And I enrolled in an advanced Indonesian class. And it was pleasant enough. We chatted a lot. The teacher kind of came round and chatted with us, orally corrected things a little bit, helped out a little bit. But there was never really any roundup. There was certainly no board work. There was no record of errors. There was not really any record of any new language. Everything just kind of came and went on the wind. And after about six weeks, we realized that we could go and sit in a cafe up the road and talk to ourselves in Indonesian without paying the teacher to not really teach us very much. And I think as teachers, in a way, we're constantly walking a kind of tightrope in the classroom where we're constantly having to strike a balance between a humanistic focus on our learners as real people and a sort of pragmatic focus on our students as language learners. So when I was thinking about this talk, one of the first things I did was to try to imagine how I might deal with a student who came to class and said, sorry I no come class, my mum she breaked the leg. And on the second page of the handout here, if you can just share it and have a quick look, uh, you've got an imaginary dialogue that I'd like to imagine I would have if this mythical student ever came to my classroom. Okay? Uh, I'll give you a few minutes just to read through it, see what's going on. Um, I'll stop you there. I think there's some interesting things going on in this little dialogue. Obviously, I would say that because I wrote it and I imagined it. Um, but bear with me here. I think if you agree that this is the best of the three ways of maybe dealing with the student whose mother she breaks the leg, it's got some interesting implications. Because I think there are four or five things going on here that are worth thinking about. I think the first thing is, what's happening is, the teacher's kind of working from chatting and empathy towards language teaching, and then moving back towards chatting and empathizing with the students. And you're constantly kind of moving along that sort of tightrope like that, where you're responding to the student, you're asking them questions, then you're saying, okay, I know what you mean, let's look at how to say that in better English, then you're asking another sort of more humane question. On top of that, I think, as a teacher, you're not just telling the students about language, but instead you're working from one student's concerns and you're trying to transform this into something which benefits all the students.